Hello and welcome to the Fugis Lab. This week we're working on our enemies. So let's start off in our trusty plan where we always start. What do we want our enemies to actually be able to do? We want them to be able to fall, move, collide with the platforms. And if we think about it, the player already has code that we can use to make those things happen. Then possibly in a future session, I don't think we'll get to it this time, we also need them to be able to collide with the bullet. We also need them to be able to reach the pit at the very bottom of the screen, which allows them to respawn at the top stronger. And we also need them to be able to hurt the player. So for now, let's make a copy of our player sprite and see how we can adapt it into being the enemy sprite. So to do that, right click on the player sprite, then normal click on duplicate. And now we've got ourselves a copy. Uh, make sure that you've got costumes selected and then use this pointer tool to select this rectangle. We want to change this to a red color so it's more obvious which one is the enemy and which one is the player. The other thing we need to do is update the name. We're going to change where it says player2 and call it enemy. Let's try a fun experiment, shall we? Click go on your project, then drag one of these boxes off to the side, and then try the controls. Try left and right. Now that's pretty fun, they're both con being controlled by left and right. Now try jumping, and you'll notice some weird things are now happening with the jump. One of the squares is falling a lot slower than the other one, and it's able to jump in midair, which is really strange. But what's happening is that they are both using the same player jump variable right up here, this one. So because they're both referring to this same variable, they're interfering with each other's jumping code. Now last time we learned about clones. Specifically, we used cloning to make copies of the bullet sprite. And if we remember, we had this diagram before. The class is the idea of what a bullet is. The constructor is the code that makes the clones or the copies of the bullets. And then all of the objects are the individual bullets. And we also talked a little bit about how we could use clones to make different races in a racing game as well. Now, we also learned about variables two sessions ago. Remember, the variable is the magical box, but it can only hold one thing at a time. Why are these things related to each other? Well, variables can either be global or local. A global variable can be accessed by all of the sprites and all of the clones, but there's only one of them. And if you have a local variable, then that variable only exists for an individual sprite or an individual clone. So if we were making this racing game with local and global variables, which of the variables would be local and which would be global? What about speed? Would speed be a global variable? Do all of the races in a racing game have the same speed all at the same time? No, that'd be ridiculous. They've all got different speeds that they can overtake each other. What about weather? Like if there was rain and that made the track more difficult to drive on? Well, that would be a global variable. It's the one variable that affects everyone and all of the races are able to access it. What about steering? Do all of the races steer in the same direction at the same time? No, they all steering in different directions. What about power-ups? If one racer pick, pick, picks up a power-up, do they all gain the same power-up? No, they have individual local variables for the power-up. Now, what about the name of the racetrack? This would be a global variable because it's the same for all of the races at the same time. In Scratch, it calls a global variable for all sprites and it calls a local variable for this sprite only. So this is how we make these two types of variables. Now remember, a global variable is one that can be accessed by everything in your game. All of your sprites, all of your clones can all see the variable and change the variable, but there's still only one variable. It's one magical box with one thing inside it, one value. But a local variable can only be seen by the sprite that has it, and if there are a bunch of clones of that sprite, a bunch of copies, each individual copy, each individual clone will have its own version of the local variable. Okay, let's get back to the code. So click on your enemy sprite, then click on code up here, and let's have a look and see what changes we need to make. So we're going to need to make a bunch of them. First off, 
this forever loop, which controls all of the movement, this is only happening to the original sprite, and we want it to happen to all of the clones. So let's drag this down, and let's go to Control, and get out when I start as clone. Put that on top there. Now, the other thing we're going to need to do is underneath our when green flag clicked code, we've got some stuff that changes some variables for the player, but this is for the enemy. We don't need any of this to be messing with any variables in the player, so let's get rid of those. Let's drag this back up. Now, this is the starting position of the enemy. Now, we want our starting position to be at the very top of the screen and in the middle of the screen in terms of X. So our X needs to be in the center, so that is zero and our y needs to be at the very top of the screen so that is 100 and let's say 190. Now when we hit go the enemy should go to the top of the screen in the middle that's good. Now we need to create the clones so let's get out a forever loop put it right underneath our go to xy get out a wait one seconds and get out a create clone of myself. Now let's have a look around at some of the other code, shall we? So if you have your speed boost code in here, then we should delete it. I don't think I have any inside my enemy, but if you do have some, delete the speed boost code. We don't need this jump, so let's get rid of this little jump box here, and then get rid of this define jump. We don't need that anymore. Now let's have a look at our gravity and our Y collision. Now, first thing we'll notice is a lot of these variables, player, Y, movement, player, jump. We want new variables. So we want a Y movement variable for the enemy. And remember what we just learned about local variables, global variables. We want this new variable to be a local variable. So let's do that. Click on make a variable. Make sure that you click the for this sprite only and call this Y movement. Then when you press OK, let's have a look and see what it looks like. You'll notice it's actually called it enemy colon Y movement. This is Scratch's way of telling you that this is a for this sprite only variable and this is a for all sprites variable. So this one is the local variable and it's local to the enemy sprite. So now we need to go through and replace all these old variables with the new one. So let's click on where it says player Y movement and change it to Y movement. Let's drag out this player Y movement and drag in a Y movement. Then let's have a look over here for define Y collision. And we'll do the same thing. We'll replace this one with this one. Make sure that you're putting your Y movement into the first little socket of this more than. Now here's something interesting. Set player jump to one. We want this just to be gone completely. We might code our enemies to jump at some point in the future, but for now, we just want to get rid of this set player jump because otherwise the enemies will interfere with the player's jump. Uh, now we've got to change this one as well, set player Y movement. Let's change that to a Y movement. Uh, that looks about right. I don't see anything that says player anymore. That's good. Although we'll need to change this in a second. For now, let's give this a test and let's see what happens. So we hit go and you should be getting your enemies falling down like this. We've got our original up there and all the clones being made. Now, this is interesting. Press right and left and you'll notice that all of the enemies can be controlled by left and right, which is pretty fun, pretty cool, but it's not ultimately what we want, is it? So let's give the enemies some X movement of their own. So first thing we're gonna do is gonna look for define move left, and we actually don't need this at all. So get out this move left, let's throw that away, and then throw away the entirety of define move left, and then let's make some changes to our define move right. So right click here, then edit, then change this to X move. This is going to do both left and right movement for the enemy. Then press OK. So the first thing is we'll notice there's an if key right arrow pressed, which is great for the player, 
because we want the player to move around when we're pressing arrow keys, but we don't want the enemies to be responding to that. So let's take out this change X and let's throw out this if completely. Then let's put this whole bit of code back up into define X move. And we've got this player X speed variable. We don't want that. So let's make a new variable. Let's click on make a variable. Again, we want this to be a local variable. So click on for this sprite only. Then we're going to call this X speed. Let's replace our player X speed with our new X speed variable. And then we need to make sure that our enemies actually have a speed at the beginning of the game. So let's get out a set, change this to X speed, and we'll say it starts off at four. And we want this to happen at the beginning of the game. So go looking for when green flag clicked, and put it right there. Now here's a little trick. How do you know what's inside a variable? Because up till now, all the global variables that we've been making, it's very easy. We just need to have a look here and it's inside this orange box. But things get very tricky when you're dealing with local variables. Because what if we have a bunch of copies of this red enemy sprite here and they all have different versions of the enemy movement and the enemy X speed variable? How do we know what the values are for each individual separate clone? Well, let's go to the code and I'll show you how I do it. You have a look for when I start as clone and then right here underneath gravity, go to looks, get out a say hello. And if we hit go, we've now got all of the clones individually saying hello. But now replace this with a variable. Let's start off with the Y movement variable. We can see how fast all of them are falling. Okay, so now zero, and you can see they've got all these different numbers and that's how fast they are falling. And they're always zero when they're touching the ground because they're not falling anymore. We can also replace this Y movement with an X speed variable. And now they'll tell us what speed that they're moving in terms of X movement. Now you've probably already noticed that they're all getting stuck on this wall. We need to put something into the code that makes them bounce off the wall and keep moving. Now we could do something complicated like an if moving in this direction and touching wall then change your speed to the other direction. But there's a very simple way to do this using only one line of code. So go to your define X move because we've got our if touching platforms and we're going to put it right here. We're going to go to set X speed to, and then we're going to get out a operator. We're going to get out a multiply operator, which is one, two, three from the top. Multiply is represented by a little star when you're using computer programming instead of an X like you would use in your maths class. Then what, we're going to, what are we going to multiply? Well, Go to variables, get out your X speed. We are going to multiply that by minus one. Now, this might seem a little strange at first. How does this work? Think about it like this. If I gave you a number four and I said, what's four times minus one? That's minus four. Four times minus one is minus four. What's five times minus one? That's minus five. Okay, but then what if I said, what's minus five times minus one? Well, some of you might already know, but if you times a minus by a minus, you get a positive. So minus five times minus one is five. So this is actually a really useful bit of maths because timesing something by minus one mirrors it. It doesn't matter what the number is. If it's a hundred, you times it by minus one, it becomes minus a hundred. If it's minus a hundred, you times it by minus one, it becomes back to a hundred. So this will always work no matter what your speed is. And if we hit go, you'll notice now that the characters will change between four and minus four. And every time they hit a wall, they will bounce and change their direction. And what we can even do is take this same line of code, if you right click on it and duplicate, let's put this right into our forever loop that makes all the clones. And then what it will do is it will alternate between the clones moving first to one side, then to the other. So now this looks a lot more natural. You've got the each clone is 
coming out in like the reverse direction to the previous one. Now there's only one more thing I think I really want to change, and that is this original enemy here can still be visible, which is a bit weird. So let's do something very similar to what we did with our bullet code. Let's hide the original enemy sprite. Let's go to looks, get out a hide, and put that right underneath when green flag clicked. But do you remember what this led to with our bullet? If we hide the original, all the clones will be hidden. So we've got to make sure we get out a show block and put that right underneath when I start as clone. Now let's give this a look and the original has disappeared. The clones are still visible. So with that, I think all I need to do is untick a few of these variables. And for now, I might move this say X speed and we've got a now a very clean looking game. That's all we've got time for this session. Subscribe and ring the bell to see the next episode and let me know in the comments what you would like me to do next or if you need any help with your code. I can't answer the comments like I used to, but if you are an experienced coder, why don't you see if you can leave a comment to help people who are asking those questions. Aside from that, stay awesome, be cool to each other and take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time, ninjas.